hope you can see me. I'm always virtually challenged on these uh, podiums, but I'll make sure that you hear my voice. Um, but I'm coming to you from a different perspective. I'm a politician. I chair the Public Accounts Committee, the House of Commons, so we oversee value for money for all uh, public expenditure. And over time, with the abolition of the Audit Commission, we will be taking on overseeing value for money for um, uh, all those areas that were previously, uh, to date, have been covered by the Audit Commission. So we're extending our role massively. Whether we're fit for purpose is another question. We're, we're a committee we've been in existence, and I'll just tell you a tiny bit about us, we've been in existence for 160 years. We were founded by Gladstone. I have the most fantastic room in the House of Commons on the Upper Committee Corridor, overlooking the tents. So we got a good view of the Jubilee um, uh, when, when, when uh, the boats went past. Uh, and then my funniest story about it is I've got pictures of all my pre illustrious predecessors up, up in the room. And one is Harold Wilson. And apparently, at that time, MPs didn't have um, uh, their own rooms. They used to sit in sort of the old style school desks and other committee corridors, except for the chair of the Public Accounts Committee. And Harold Wilson decided that he wanted the job simply because he wanted the room. Um, I'm the first one who's been, the, the committee's always chaired by the opposition, which is quite important. But I'm the first person to have been elected, and I was elected by all my peers, so I was elected by every member of parliament, whatever the political party, and that, I think, gives me greater authority. I'm also the first woman ever to have held the job. And I always say, having been a minister in most of the Blair Brown years, that I've got better security of tenure in this job than I have had as a minister. Uh, we, do, we, can, we do about 50 reports a year, which is a lot, we can cover absolutely everything. So one minute I'll be thinking about tax, the next minute about neurological conditions in health, and the next minute about um, housing benefit. You really do cover the whole swathe. But all our reports, interestingly enough, are unanimous, although we have a majority of our members are conservatives. So we work very hard to make sure that um, we have a unanimous view of what we say. And I think one of the reasons we achieve that is whatever your political perspective, everybody cares about value for money. Uh, and so you know, there's a shared interest in that. And the other thing is that we all have, on the whole look backwards, not forwards. So we're not arguing about making a policy, we're looking at actually the implementation of policy, although of course that's a very blurred line. And increasingly we're trying to look at past uh, performance to inform current and future practice. So, HS1 would be a classic example which we looked at, and we hope that that will help inform the government's approach to HS2. We're supported by the NAO, so the uh, National Audit Office, they've got 900 staff. Um, I've got really nobody except a little committee section that spend most of their time just um, doing our paper. Um, but um, and what we work closely, we are very sort of uh, uh, interdependent, but we have separate and different objectives. Uh, and I can't tell and shouldn't be able to tell the National Audit Office what they should look at, because I might tell them not to look at the waste of money with my mom very hard, which would be completely wrong. But equally, uh, their perspective is different for us, and we represent we are parliament and we represent the public interest in a very, very clear way through our democratic mandate. So it's quite an interesting relationship between us. What I have got is a bunch of really committed and hard-working MPs across the political spectrum who put in a lot of work to enable us to be effective. And the current environment on public expenditure is of course hugely important that we get the best value out of every taxpayer's fund. And uh, the pressure is on you as procurement professionals to ensure that you really do most to raise your game, continuous improvement, um, uh, and help deliver better services for less money through whether it's better specification, better schedule, more professional approach, uh, tougher negotiating, or better project management. So all the community things that you have to do that. Um, I have to say, and I agree with this thing, that we're always, we always sort of beat ourselves in the public sector 
And we ought to every now and again think, we don't always do a bad job. If you look at the Olympics, we did a fantastically good job. The uh, Olympic Olympic of Delivery Authority, in particular, with the distinction between them and Hobart, in delivering in budget, on time, very, very fun and terrific venues. Uh, and uh, we should look at the strengths of some of these public projects. Turn off five is another one which was delivered on time and scheduled in a very well managed project, uh, rather than always emphasising our weaknesses. As a committee, we do try and give publicity to good projects. The problem is they never get coverage. And I, I always have a classic story of um, we did a report on 16 to 18 year old education, uh, education where we basically said things are going well, obviously room for improvement, it's not a bad story. I get rung up by the Today programme saying, will you come on next tomorrow? And I said, fine, this is what I'm saying. She said, I thought you were going to be critical. I said, no, 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 it's actually quite a good report. She said, I'm going to go away and read, read it, which she then did, came back and said, sorry, we're dropping the item. Um, now, what I really want to say to you is my observations from the sort of experience of two years in the job um, as to the sort of issues that come up too often. I think the first thing I say is too often in, in this area of procurement, we're driven by short-term interests, which I think damage uh, uh, us in the long term, and certainly lead to long-term costs. And the greatest example of this is the private finance initiative. Um, I was always one to defend it in the early days because it seemed to me it was a mechanism which enabled us to produce, and it did, hospitals and schools when, um, when public uh, expenditure was not freely available to meet the demand for the renewal of the estate, both the hospital estate and the education estate. But um, I think if you look at where we are now, we've got 700 PFI projects over the last 20 years. If you look at the long-term commitment of that on the government and local authority balance sheet, it is enormous. And this government came in determined actually to um, ensure that um, we got rid of the worst aspects of PFI. I and mean, actually what they've been and gone and done is signed 41 projects and they're negotiating a further 30. So despite their good intent, they haven't changed their practice. And what about criticism of it? I think sometimes they're used inappropriately. So if I take one example, we looked at a, a defense procurement contract for a future strategic tanker aircraft, which is an aircraft which is supposed to take our troops over to theaters of war and it's supposed to allow refueling mid-air. Um, and it's not that complicated. It's a, it's a standard Airbus which needed some, uh, some modification to be fit for purpose. It took nine years to, nine years to uh, negotiate the contract. Um, and then because they used PFI as the vehicle, because it was off balance sheet, um, it's very difficult to change the specification. And when they finally signed the contract, they found that they were, had um, specified an aircraft without the appropriate covering on it, so it couldn't go into the theatre at all because it would be uh, shot down, and the first it would get to was Cyprus. And that is an example for me, I don't think, particularly in defence procurement, where they're always changing specification and they're always at the cutting edge of technology, PFI is inappropriate. We think of other instances. So it was it appropriate? I think the other thing is that the assumptions that too often are made when the cost-benefit analysis is undertaken uh, are just suspect. They're, they're put in to make the case rather than as, um, objectively uh, appropriate assumptions which enable you to say this is a value-for-money mechanism way of delivering a capital pro um, project. And it's the use of deflating the way that the deflator is being used over time, it's just absolutely very obvious that they changed it just to uh, just to um, get the result they wanted. And then we uncovered some another tiny thing, but important, was that one of the assumptions that was put into whether or not you've been on the PFI route is an assumption that you will get some uh, um, tax back from the providers, from the contractors who build the project and manage it for you. That's all well and good unless they take it offshore. 
and most of them do take it offshore, so any local building and tax uh, revenue from it um, is, is not true. So again, assumptions matter. Um, I think if you look across the pieces, it's true of health, it's true of education, that's probably more than education. We lock ourselves into specified services over too long a period which makes it impossible when you're then trying to find financial savings as we are with the deficit reduction program, impossible to find sensible operational savings. And I was interested here to show an example where you were able to sit down with some of your contractors and actually go <laughs> within the contract um, uh, cut uh, financial savings and presume changes in what uh, you would agree in the contract to deliver. And I don't think they're clever enough to do, uh, to do that. And the other thing we have found is just that excessive profits are being made and too little risk is being transferred in too many of the PFIs. And we see the uh, realization of those profits as you see the PFI projects being bought and sold uh, on, the, on the market. They're really on massive, massive profits being made. And the fact that very little risk is honestly transferred in the new PFI project is the debt, the uh, repayments are or first call on any resources you have, so you're probably the best bet uh, of anybody that the people are doing business with is not reflected in the price that you pay. And that, I think, comes out of the lack of skills that we have in the public sector to, um, to really uh, negotiate a tough uh, contract. Uh, so uh, we, we've come up with lots of suggestions. I, the government takes some, not all. I think you have to build into the contracts mechanisms to share profits if they exceed a specified level. There should be much greater openness. I have a great bug in my um, right through all this, which may not please all of you in the audience today. But I think in my um, task of following the taxpayers' pound, I don't accept that where the taxpayers' pound is being used in the private sector to do the public services. Private sector should be high, able to hide behind commercial confidentiality and not open this book so that we can see whether or not we're getting value. And I think either building it into the contract specification or extending freedom of information ought to be able to, to enable us to follow the taxpayers' plan to ensure that you get your value, <coughs> whether, it's, whether it's contracts being delivered through the um, uh, uh, where, where particularly it's contracts being delivered through the private sector. And that's as true of PFI as it is of all the people who are providing us with uh, welfare support or, um, uh, you know, dare I say, in uh, delivering the, um, the, the, the uh, security services on the uh, Olympic side. So we have to have much better openness. Uh, the process of bidding takes far too long. One of the, one of, you know, it is ridiculous, and therefore the cost, and therefore the ability to get a real market going in the private sector, I think is, is highly constrained. And the pricing of equity in the by contracts is clearly too high, and higher than the risk of justifying. I think competition there on its own does not give the best value. So uh, PFI leads me really to three other observations which I think are much more de generic problems around procurement. As you look at PFI and as you look at procurement across government, uh, one of the things that strikes you is that the responsible individual for delivering a particular contract doesn't stay in the job long enough. Uh, and uh, it's so true of defence, and then the turnover means that every new person who takes on the job feels they've got to add their value of their own so they change the specifications so the costs go up. And indeed, in the civil service, your progress is determined by, the, by your ability to change jobs every two years. I always tell this terrible story. The job I had on the same government was the ch children's minister. And at the end of two, two and a half years, I had more institutional knowledge than most of the senior civil servants with whom I was having to deal and take forward. Uh, the implementation of policy that we agree. That's not good enough and you have to change the way in which you manage the civil service, in which you reward excellence. So it's not just by just switching jobs, it might be by just getting a better grade and more money in the job that you're in. It's absolutely critical in that. And if I tell you that it's farm control, that disastrous 
project, which cost us as taxpayers half a billion pounds, where we try to set up nine or ten regional centres to take 999 calls, and we saw what was white elephants sitting around the country, unused. There were ten senior responsible officers for that project in five years. We look at future UK deterrent capability, there were three senior responsible officers there in 18 months. The other thing that comes out, so that's the first thing, keep the person there. The other general thing that comes out, yeah, generic thing that comes out of the PFI story, is commercial skills. They're traditionally not valued in central government and civil service. You come in to devise policy, not to deliver public services. That is changing. And I'm just one of those people who don't accept that even you know, civil servants can't do it. Of course they can. You get very, very bright people coming in to central government. They just need to acquire the appropriate training and skills. And we just don't do that well enough. But we do spend money on training. Uh, that in 09 10, we spent over 500 pounds per person on training. But I think anybody who is here in the audience who is a civil servant, so I think most civil servants find that a lot of the training they do doesn't help them do their job proper better. So it's actually getting the appropriate training, not finding the money for training, which it enables you to develop the project management and commercial skills uh, that you need. Um, and the other thing I was going to say that comes out of the PFI that is a generic problem is there's this general view of localism now. Everything, everything can be done at the local level, whether it's the individual academy school, or whether it's the individual uh, free school, or whether it's the individual foundation trust. And at that level, the skills are often not there to be able to ensure that you have really effective procurement, whether it's of buildings or whether it's actually of consumables. And I don't think we are clever enough. Um, we, well, we haven't thought through how you combine that localism with sensible, effective value for money and procurement, where government can take advantage of the fact that it's a bulk buyer. And NHS procurement, which we came out with, we did a terrible study on, we found very simple things that 61 trusts bought 21 different types of A4 paper, just silly. That's, there are 652 different types of gloves being bought by NHS organisation, and then there were 1,751 different types of cannulas being bought. You just think of that and think, God, if we could only be more sensible and take advantage of our, bar, our buying power, we could eke out much, much better value for every money in taxpayers power. Finally, I want to talk about two case, case histories where uh, we really should learn the lessons of what goes wrong as we move to the future. And the first one uh, is one that I've chosen two which are in the um, public, you know, just the, the, in the news at the moment. The one is the, uh, the West Coast mainland, where we've got um, uh, Richard Branson jumping up and down and saying this has been a terrible procurement, but the government hasn't learned its lesson past failures. But we haven't looked at it yet, and we may well do so if it appropriate for Jews at this time. But it is undoubtedly true that the Department of Transport has got things terribly wrong in the way that it's led franchises in the past. And the East Coast mainline is a classic example of where things <coughs> go badly wrong. Uh, if, uh, up till now, we've done franchises for anything between seven and ten years. This new West Coast franchise now is 15 franchise, you're tying yourself in for a long time, and the companies bid on the amount of subsidy they need, and then the premium that they're going to uh, repay to government uh, for the defined service, and clearly it's all based on the assumption about passenger numbers. And what we found in the East Coast mainline is, is, is really important, there are 19 million people who use that East Coast mainline. The franchise was let in 2005 to Great North Eastern Railway, and they'd just been ridiculously optimistic about passenger numbers. They gave up the franchise two years later, and it was taken over by National Express on the basis that they'd give back to us, the taxpayer, 1.4 billion pounds uh, over seven and a half years. That was in 07. The recession hit us in 08. Their passenger numbers went right down, and by 09, 
they said they wanted out. They offered, I would say that we never got 1.4 billion, they offered to give us 150 million back. The Department of Transport decided that wasn't a very good idea because it would give a message to other contractors that they would buy out of contracts. Uh, and they finally settled the department with getting back from National Express and the 120 million pounds. So having offered 150, they get 120 million pounds. And the worst of the story is that National Express are still allowed to tender for all the franchises that are coming up now. So I have a bit of sympathy with Richard Branson. <coughs> I don't, he's a you know, charismatic guy, but I don't entirely trust him. Virgin have also not got the world's best record at sticking to the terms of their contract and franchise when they land. And my final story is the chief rest story, because this was really interesting. The government, OCA, Home Office, Department for, for Culture, Media and Sport, decided to incredibly they paid stage to increase the number of security personnel they wanted, more than double, from 10,000 to 23,000. And you really think, what on earth is happening? We knew from day one of winning the uh, bid that security was going to be the main challenge, and leaving the numbers until the very last minute is just the sort of Poor project planning, uh, which you will be hearing, you will no doubt be uh, addressing all day. That late decision doubled the amount of money that the government had to put in to uh, for venue security. But for G4S, their contract went up from 86 million to 284 million. They were doubling their numbers, but the contract increase was a fourfold increase. And you thought all the setting up costs would stay the same. If you actually look at that, their program management costs went up from 7 million to 60 million. Their operational costs went up twentyfold, from 3 million to 65 million. So when we looked at this about April, May, I can't remember it was it looked bonkers, it looked appalling value for money, and it looked completely impossible to deliver, suddenly having to find an extra 10,000 people. And I will never forget the array of top executives before us from local, home office, and DCMS, looking at me askance when I said, you can't deliver that, saying, oh yes, we can. We are completely certain that uh, that is all. And um, it ended up, we, you know, I mean, the, the, anybody who went to the Olympics, the uh, answers did a fantastic job, but we still haven't bottomed out the extra cost of that, because a lot of them were not that their holidays, etc. So there were hidden costs that we've got to do. I don't, I'm still not convinced that um, G4S didn't walk away with their profit or whatever they say. But, but what is particularly the case is that this was a bad example, set, set beside the really great example of the ODA, of when contract management and procurement went accordingly wrong. So you're pretty high profile when you get things wrong. You're sadly less high profile when you get things right. And I know you get things right very, very often. And just listening to the Sheffield example is very, very hard. I'm sure there's a lot of similar exemplars of best practice sitting in the room today. But from our perspective in the uh, Public Accounts Committee, helping you and supporting you to raise your game at a time when we know it's vital to get as much of the public really meeting the great needs that we all have in our community. It's very, very important. So really I want to end by saying thank you for the work that you do. Thank you.
you would have seen that we've been very, very critical of the work program. Um, we're, we are about to consider our, a further report on that, and then I think we'll do further investigation. Um, we're an early days of payment for results, and I'm not against it at all. I think that's, it, it, it's an interesting concept which we should, uh, we should uh, explore. Um, but, and there are various buts, if you look at something like the Welfare to Work program, um, if, it, if it means that um, people are just, you know, taking a low hanging fruit, so it's people who are very close to the labor market who get into work anyway, rather than working with those who are more distant from the market, you're not meeting your policy of objective of trying to get everybody back in the market. So the terms of the contract are such that they will may well encourage um, uh, people to uh, 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 you know, not really do the work for which is intended. And I think the other thing there is that, and it comes a little bit, that price has been such an imperative that coming in at the lowest price may mean that they can't meet the policy objective. And then you have unintended consequences because you'll have more people staying on benefits, which actually is still a massive cost to the public purse. And I think, from what I've seen, some of you may have seen a Channel 4 different work on this, that the actual results from many of the early providers are so, so poor that the likelihood of any of them meeting the tough targets that have been set at the price that was allowed um, is highly unlikely to occur. So we've got a lot of questions. A very early report we did on the work program, just to show this is politically impartial, was on Labour's attempt to use both the private and the public sector in delivering welfare work programs. That's particularly around people with disability. The evidence there suggested actually that Job Centre Plus was providing better value than the private providers we looked at who came back and we negotiated the contract, took the low hanging fruit, um, you know, didn't achieve the targets they were set and various other things. And what rather depressed me was that the ideology overrode the pragmatism in the government's decision to privatise the entire work program against the evidence of the better performance of Job Centre Plus. Any further questions? Ladies and gentlemen.